Stanford University. Thank you. Thank you for coming out tonight. And um, I wanted to sort of play on the theme of combining talking about survivorship and um, the contributions that surgery has um, given us uh, to enhance women's uh, breast cancer survivorship and um, the outcomes in women with breast cancer. So I, I wanted to highlight some of the recent advances in the recent decades of things that have helped us improve outcomes for women. And one of the bigger ones is better imaging and, di and better diagnostic capabilities in many institutions. We also have increased use of systemic therapies, what we commonly call hormonal therapies and chemotherapy. And from a surgical perspective, we have many more tools in our shed. We have all sorts of different operations that we can offer uh, uh, different patients and, and try to individualize and tailor those choices to the condition of the patient. And that's mainly what I'm going to focus on and focus on the advances that have been made in that field. And so one way to look at it is that women today compared to women decades ago have many more choices. And I think that this has contributed to improve survival and also enhance quality of life, which is what everyone wants. This is a slight review for those of us that are not is familiar with a subject and this diagram really shows us how breast cancer arises uh, within the microscopic um, tissue um, in the breast. You can see on top is what we call a basic ductal structure of the normal breast which is lined by normal one or two layers of normal cells and as you progress down the graph um, you can see um, that more and more cells occupy that, uh, that tube. And so there's a transition from normal cells through something that we call atypia, through what we call carcinoma in situ, which is a non-invasive type of breast cancer, to the typical breast cancer that we know as invasive breast cancer. So um, not every woman who develops breast cancer goes through each step and each phase within her breast. Some women uh, typically develop an invasive breast cancer without any evidence of non-invasive breast cancer, but other women may have all this full uh, spectrum of varieties in their breast tissue. Now one of the things that has really changed dramatically in the last 30 some years is that because we have more mammographic screening and because the, um, the, the mammograms that we can perform have, uh, uh, the quality of them has improved, we have seen an increase in the number of breast cancers. We think it has to do with education awareness and um, the uh, mammographic screening. But there's two types of uh, breast cancer that are highlighted here. And um, the uh, invasive cancer is your green graph. And we show that since about the, uh, 1983, when widespread mammographic screening began, um, invasive breast cancer has increased by 35%. But mammographic screening has also helped us find things that are really quite small, subclinical, microscopic, and that mostly relates to ductal carcinoma in situ. And the increase in the number of ductal carcinoma in situ that we have found has really uh, increased much more dramatically by about 500%. So now let's turn a little bit to how surgery has changed in these same decades. And, and really the changes were dramatic. Up until uh, 1985 or the early 80s, really the only operation that was available to women with breast cancer was radical mastectomy or modified radical mastectomy as there was a transition in the 70s. And the options of, of reconstruction after mastectomy were quite limited for patients because A, we did not have uh, good plastic surgery techniques, nor uh, the, uh, the type of implants that we have available today, nor the um, microscopic uh, plastic surgery technology that, we, um, that has uh, evolved over the last few decades. But by 1985, 
uh, clinical trials were done in Europe and the United States that showed for the first time that for most women with early stage breast cancer, stage one and stage two, that mastectomy and lumpectomy, as you can see the pictures on your right, were equivalent in terms of survival. Now, the differences between the two were obvious. Women for a long, long time, for over 100 years, wished um, that they could be treated for their breast cancer, be cured for their breast cancer, and with, uh, with hopefully avoiding mastectomy. And those early findings in 1985, those results that were first reported at five years, then at 10, 15, and 20, have remained constant. And this is a comparison. These three lines are three different types of treatment that were used in a clinical trial, which compared mastectomy to lumpectomy to lumpectomy and radiation. And you can see you don't need to be a mathematician or a biostatistician, that all three curves virtually overlap over a 20-year period. This is the beauty of clinical trials, of what we call randomized trials, where patients are sorted into different groups, but they all have similar characteristics. And really, this is sort of the infrastructure of our, of our fund of knowledge. Most of the decisions that doctors use uh, or make today are based on um, clinical trials evidence. So when a doctor makes a recommendation to a woman today, it's based on this type of clinical trial that has given us solid information to be able to say this is probably a better choice for you as an individual. Um, one of the other things that we've learned from other clinical trials along the way, and I cannot cover um, the full breadth and depth of all the advances that have occurred in the last 30 years is that for women who did receive lumpectomy or who were appropriate candidates for lumpectomy and can be treated this way. Um, whoops, let me go back. Uh, sorry. Um, the women that received no additional treatment other than surgery and radiation after lumpectomy to the breast had a higher local recurrence rate, um, over 10%, if you can make it out in the graph, compared to women who received some form of what we call systemic therapy. That could be hormonal therapy or chemotherapy. So what we learned um, early on is that the results and, um, with lumpectomy were better if a woman also, in addition to radiation, received some other form of therapy hormonal therapy or radiation therapy. And this gave us some very clear insight that there's some synergism by all these different types of treatments. So today the basic options facing many uh, women with early stage breast cancer, and perhaps you can see on your left hand uh, panel is a sort of rounded mass within a mammogram on the far end of the panel. Um, so if the tumor is of a size of five centimeters or less, most women are eligible to receive a lumpectomy as a form of primary surgical treatment for their breasts. However, on the other side, I tried to show you an example of a type of mammographic abnormality, which we call microcalcifications, and that if it's, and, and microcalcifications can often represent the existence of a cancer in the breast, invasive or non-invasive. And if that area is very great, measuring more than five centimeters, then typically those patients are not considered good candidates based on our experience from clinical trials um, to undergo lumpectomy. So those patients, it's more appropriate to undergo mastectomy. And in terms of invasive breast cancer, the standard uh, for a long time, and I will um, explain later in what areas we can deviate from this, um, the typical treatment involves evaluating the lymph nodes that drain the breast, mostly under the arm, which we call the axillary nodes, and the procedure of th the part of the surgery that's performed in the um, armpit is called a nodal staging procedure. Now, to give you an example of how 
uh, things have changed and that we often don't have clinical trials evidence for everything we do. Um, lumpectomy certainly has matured. It's been around for 25 years. It's no longer new, even though sometimes um, many patients that I encounter still feel that it's a new option. Um, and it's been extended now to patient populations that were not included in the original trials. And we're often forced to do that in surgery because we can't possibly study in a clinical trial every single um, permutation or subtype of patient. So in, in the lumpectomy and mastectomy trial that I showed you earlier on, older women, which were considered women over the age of 70, at that, in that era were not included. They were excluded because the trial began in their late 70s and um, probably the, the qualification then was that the life expectancy had to be more than 10 years and so they, they didn't qualify. Um, we've also extended it to um, non-invasive and in situ cancers um, but this has been done through um, uh, several trials um, of uh, nearly 3,000 women um, to look to see whether lumpectomy is an appropriate and safe approach. And it has been shown to be um, adequate for treating women with in situ cancers. Again, pregnant women were not included in the original trials and women with multiple cancers. But there are many physicians today who have uh, shown in small series, institutional series, that lumpectomy can ap be applied to those patient populations too. Another thing that's changing in the era of uh, lumpectomy and radiation is that the standard, and still the gold standard remains, lumpectomy with radiation to the whole breast. Um, but now there are um, have been several trials that have been finished and ongoing trying to compare whole breast radiation to partial breast radiation. Uh, the one large randomized trial ongoing in this country is not yet completed. Uh, we think that for the appropriately selected patients, it might be equivalent to only radiate part of the breast and thus enhance um, better cosmetic outcomes, less radiation changes, and also a shorter treatment which would then make radiation available to more women. One of the problems in this country is that many women that receive lumpectomy don't go on to receive radiation therapy, and that's considered to be suboptimal treatment. And it's often because they don't live close to a facility of radiation therapy or because it's very time consuming. And so there, there are many reasons. So we would like to replace many of the treatments that we have today with shorter treatments, and I think most patients would appreciate that. The other thing that really has changed dramatically has been how we can approach patients who have mastectomy. And whenever I talk about changes, there are really options for patients. Patients are not obligated to um, accept all the options that are, are given to them. And I think one of the great benefits today is that we do have more choices. Not all patients have all choices, but many patients do have choices. So we've made, um, I think, strides in general to reverse the disfiguring impact of mastectomy. Um, I think in the era of radical mastectomy, it was truly far more disfiguring. All the muscles in the chest wall were removed. Um, women really had many more problems with moving their arm and returning to normal function, altered sensation. And I think in general, even for women who receive a standard mastectomy, we do a much better job and there's less um, dysfunction. And, and we have new operative techniques in the world of plastic surgery that allow us to reconstruct the breast in a better way. And here's an example, the most common form of reconstruction is with a tissue expander or breast implant. Sometimes we, we stage the procedure. Here it's showing a, um, a tissue expander and, um, and sort of the look that you get after mastectomy um, with a standard mastectomy and implant reconstruction. Alternatively, one of the other things that plastic surgeons can offer is doing these um, what we call myocutaneous tissue flaps, that is taking tissue usually from the abdomen, but it can be from the back or sometimes even the thighs, 
and um, transfer to the area of the breast, uh, doing uh, my, um, a microsurgery to uh, hook up the blood supply of the transferred tissue to uh, the blood supply of the chest wall. And we can recreate a satisfactory looking mound that it mimics the volume of the breast that is missing. And then there are other techniques like um, tattooing or reconstructing a nipple that can give a rather satisfactory, if not perfect, um, look after surgery. Now, jumping back a little bit at, to imaging, one of the newest comers on the scene for uh, changes in advances in imaging has been the introduction of magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI. Um, MRI may be better in certain patient populations, that is, able to perhaps find small cancers, especially in dense breast. Um, it's not a screening tool with the exception of women who are very high risk and are known to be carriers of a mutation that predisposes them for um, breast cancer. So, on the other hand, not everything shows up on MRI. And MRI has, as shown here, you can sort of tell by the whiteout on the panel of the breast on top and the one um, below that um, sometimes uh, MRI can, for a variety of reasons that are not well understood, overestimate the size of a tumor, and other times they can underestimate. So um, here I show you an example of one case that I've had where MRI did overestimate the size of the tumor. But fortunately with that patient we attempted, she very much wanted to keep her breast, we attempted lumpectomy, um, and we were successful. Um, some uh, investigators in this country, like Monica Morrow, have shown that the use of MRI has increased our conversion rate to mastectomy. Um, and not everyone agrees. But I must say that even though uh, we had this very slow and long trajectory to, um, uh, to offsetting uh, this uh, long uh, history and um, of, of using radical mastectomy to treat breast cancer, there's been over the last five years, if not last ten years, a big resurgence of the use of mastectomy. And many investigators by, by, like myself have been surprised because we certainly were um, educated in the era of lumpectomy. And we think that it's largely driven by the fear of recurrence, which is always something um, that's a big concern for any patient who uh, develops breast cancer. And secondly, perhaps the, the burden of facing continuous surveillance is another issue that really, I think, for some patients uh, triggers a decision uh, or drives a decision to undergo mastectomy. And, you know, the, the burden of breast imaging is, is real. Um, Decades ago, we only had physical exam, then we had mammography, we have ultrasound, we have MRI, and there's often recommendations to have interval exams every, you know, six months. And those things, um, for many patients, uh, having so many exams becomes a, a psychologically um, difficult situation. On the other hand, um, we also have to, even though our imaging has gotten better in terms of finding cancers, it's gotten better in finding other things that may not always be clinically significant. So we are concerned at some level that, yes, I showed you we're finding many more in situ cancers, and there's discussions uh, within uh, the breast cancer world that uh, many of these non-invasive breast cancers would never evolve or become life-threatening. And it's, um, the problem is that we don't have a good a way of identifying which are the good non-invasive breast cancers and which are not. And ma many people have tried, there have been all sorts of uh, clinical studies to separate, separate out low-grade lesions and just excise them and observe them. And it's not clear that there is any particular subset that doesn't, A, um, benefit from radiation therapy after lumpectomy. So, and here's to show you a little bit of the trends that have occurred in this country um, 
with the issue not only of increasing mastectomy, but what we call contralateral prophylactic mastectomy. And that means that women who choose to have mostly mastectomy on the affected side often, um, or it seems more and more, are choosing to have the other breasts removed. And, and here is just on the left-hand side is to show you um, how those rates have gone up. Um, and, and the study is old. It only goes up to 2003. On the left-hand side, it's invasive breast cancer. On the right-hand side is for in situ cancer. Um, and these trends seem to ha are continuing to increase. And I think it is for a variety of reasons. One is, again, to um, if you already have a cancer on one side, to uh, forego the screening on the other side, and for symmetry. And I think plastic surgeons often discuss those issues, and, um, and that's, I think, uh, one of the influences that we're seeing. Um, on the other hand, um, we have made other strides in terms of um, mastectomy. We've tried to make it more appealing, more acceptable, um, and um, more natural looking. And one of these approaches is uh, a technique of um, what we call nipple in a real or sparing mastectomies. It's an approach that's not for all women. It's been largely applied to women who are seeking to have prophylactic mastectomies because they're high risk, or women with small tumors that are not too close to the nipple and who are choosing to have mastectomy. And um, this procedure, um, as shown here, this is one of my patients within 24 hours after surgery having a nipple sparing mastectomy with um, a partial expansion. And so the appearance is certainly more natural than some of the other pictures maybe that I've shown you. Unfortunately, we cannot offer this yet to everyone or we don't have the clinical experience that we can make this the appropriate choice at this time for every woman. And here is um, a more avant-garde approach to um, a patient who um, had had chemotherapy up front and also was a high-risk carrier, had bilateral mastectomies, and clearly, um, Although the recommendation was against having a nipple sparing mastectomy because she had, um, she was a carrier of, uh, for a uh, mutation for breast cancer and had one, she chose to do this because it was her compromise between um, quality of life and the way she needed to feel about herself um, and her, uh, how she wanted her uh, life to be. So. The more significant changes um, that have occurred also in the last 15 years have been the way we've approached removing lymph nodes. And uh, those of us that are older and remember the era of complete axillary node dissections and certainly in the era of radical mastectomy, many women developed swelling of their arm, what we call lymphedema. And it was related to the extent of surgery, uh, removing all the lymph nodes, uh, being rather aggressive in the surgical approach and often radiation to follow. Um, but it became very clear that many women were presenting with earlier stage disease and that their nodes didn't have um, any uh, tumor in them. And so for those patients in particular, a technique was developed to identify what we call this, the, the sentinel node or the first draining node or several nodes um, that are the most informative nodes. And if these nodes uh, turn out to be histologically under a microscopic pathological exam negative, then one can avoid removing additional nodes. And I think that's another example of how we've improved our surgical technique and at the same time improve um, the quality of survivorship. And this is to show you how we do it. We do it with by injecting a radioisotope or a blue dye, which are, uh, are only selectively picked up by the lymphatic channels and therefore can guide, the surgeon can identify these few nodes among the many that exist in the axilla. And if, um, if those nodes are negative, as I said, the woman can avoid um, more radical surgery in the axilla. Um, 
the tide continues uh, to shift, so to speak, and, and now there's been some early evidence from a, a clinical trial, somewhat controversial, that was only done in uh, women who, who received lumpectomy and radiation to the entire breast, where women with uh, some positive nodes with low volume disease in their nodes um, uh, did not receive completion axillary node dissection. And it seems, at least in the these early results from this limited trial that the axillary recurrence rate was equally low as for women who had a complete axillary dissection. So it's a promising change. We've known for a long time that nodal staging, for the most part, uh, removing the nodes under the arm is a staging procedure um, and hel helps with local control, uh, but it does not change survival in any way. Um, the other thing that has changed what surgeons do is how we use a systemic therapy. So obviously, as I mentioned before, women with large tumors more than five centimeters are not good candidates for breast conservation. So uh, one of the reasons to s switch the, the approach, give the chemotherapy first, is to help the tumor shrink. I think the more important factor in that is to get a sense of how sensitive the tumor is to the chemotherapy or sometimes hormonal therapy up front. And I think that this will be the way of the future. The way we're going to be able to tailor therapies for women is by giving them up front, seeing how the tumor responds, and if it doesn't go away completely, shift gear, so to speak. Um, and, and tumors that um, are exposed to chemotherapy up front um, can shrink one of two ways. And depending on the pattern of the way they shrink, the patient may or may not become a candidate for lumpectomy after chemotherapy. Um, many patients have very low volume of disease left behind after chemotherapy, but it may be scattered over a large uh, portion of the breast so that lumpectomy is still not feasible. Um, we still have the issue of local recurrence. So many times we treat patients up front with surgery, with chemotherapy, and years later um, the tumor returns, returns clinically, whether it has persisted there subclinically all along and grown or in the case of lumpectomy where in, um, patients have breast tissue and new cancer arises, it's not very clear. Um, but the surgeon is called in to act when there is a local recurrence as shown in the panel above. Um, or sometimes um, patients can develop what we call regional recurrences as the panel below shows um, a lymph node enlarging growing between two uh, ribs on the chest wall. Um, and so there is a, a surgeons participate in the treatment of this patient population too by doing either a mastectomy or a com usually in combination with a systemic therapy is sometimes removing a locally recurrent mass. Um, the role of the surgeon in the treatment of breast cancer isn't just limited to these operations that I've mentioned. Um, but we, we really have a more global uh, role. We, we see many women with benign breast disease. We see women who have um, lactational problems. And uh, many of us participate in, um, in high-risk surveillance. That is, women who are high risk and um, women who have these benign biopsies that show atypical changes. And and um, I don't have a slide, exactly. This, this is a slide about a, a different issue that I'm going to talk about now, which is uh, fertility preservation. Um, but the surgeons often uh, counsel women on, um, on using uh, drugs like tamoxifen to reduce their future risk of developing breast cancer. Uh, but one of the things that we do at Stanford as surgeons in combination with special um, obstetricians is that we try to encourage women, especially young women who are facing breast cancer and who want to preserve their fertility, a means of doing that. Um, it, we consider this a very important thing and in, in the general world of cancer and other cancers, uh, this subject is beginning 
um, to be recognized more and more attention is being uh, paid. So we can offer young women the possibility of um, preserving their eggs, fertilized eggs, uh, freezing them, and then they have that option in the future of, you know, bearing biological children. Um, and we did a study um, with several of our breast fellows and Dr. Westfall, who's our um, reproductive endocrinologist, and showed that really doing this and taking the time um, to preserve fertility and cryopreserve fertilized eggs did not alter the time from diagnosis uh, to the initiation of chemotherapy in a significant way. So women should be given the space and time to seek those services if they would like them. So some of the new frontiers in surgery, I'm trying to cover different areas where the surgeon has a role um, because the talk is about our contributions to the uh, treatment of breast cancer and survivorship is that um, women who present with locally advanced, or sta especially stage four disease, they have metastatic disease, for a long time um, the tumor in their breast was not treated. And there's some emerging data that um, since we're getting better at treating metastasis and we're getting better about converting this disease to a more chronic disease, that there may be a role about um, operating on that patient population. Um, and beyond that, there is some rethinking in the world of cancer that um, we haven't really gone after removing metastasis from lungs or liver or, or uh, brain we uh, often do. But there is, um, I think that there is a trend now to liberalize those approaches and again, um, view stage four disease or metastatic disease with less futility than it used to be uh, regarded, let's say, a decade or two ago. And I think that's an important change. Um, so uh, one final perspective would be is that um, our short-term goals are to make breast cancer a chronic disease. If, if we can't make it go away completely, we want to make it a chronic disease. And our long-term goals, certainly uh, physicians and all of us who do research, uh, both basic and clinical research, is um, you know, to cure all types of breast cancer, no matter how advanced or um, whether it's stage one or stage four. And ultimately, we'd like to, at the same time we're seeking to prevent and completely eradicate the disease. Um, so I think uh, the aim and the emphasis, um, and I think in my own philosophy, is that, our, um, that all physicians who are involved in the care of patients and women with breast cancer is num our number one goal is to improve their survival, but also to be very mindful of enhancing the quality of life and the quality of their survivorship, because we all want to live well, comfortably, without disfigurement, without aches and pains until we're 110. <laughs> so thank you, and I'd be happy to take some questions. So the question is, what, what chances do we have of wiping it out, and will I see it in my lifetime? Um, I sure hope so. I, I think that I'm not optimistic um, that we will uh, eradicate it in the next decade. I know that it's um, sort of a, a banner phrase by many of the organizations. I, I think one of the frustrating things about breast cancer is that there are many redundant mechanisms within the cancer cells, and we discover that we have a marker and a treatment that's targeted to the marker, and there seems to always be a population of cells that have figured a way around it. Um, so I, I, I think the mechanisms within these cancer cells are very complicated. I think we're getting better and we have more tools. We're able to tailor our treatments much more um, to the characteristics of the tumor, which we couldn't do that, you know, 20 years ago, we had hormonal therapy. Chemotherapy in general is not a very targeted therapy. But now we have better ideas about um, what subtypes of tumors um, 
may be more sensitive to different chemotherapy agents, and we have more targeted agents, more hormonal targeted agents, and we have um, uh, monoclonal antibodies like trastuzumab that target the HER2 uh, receptor, and, and more things emerging along those lines. So that um, has made it more hopeful that we can eradicate certain that there are many more patients that we can convert to cure. What would you say is the definitive method um, for diagnosing breast cancer? The question is, um, what is the definitive method of di for diagnosing breast cancer? The definitive method is to have a tissue sample or cell sample that shows that there's cancer. Now, if you're, that's, that, that's the um, evidence. Now, in terms of what imaging method, the only imaging method that's accepted for screening is mammography. And um, most of the organizations and most physicians um, have stuck with the recommendations of yearly mammography starting at age 40. There's less radiation exposure now with digital mammography. Um, we don't I know there was some criticism from the, this U.S. task force. Um, some of the criticism may be valuable, um, but we don't have something to replace mammography. So I, I, I don't think that we're in a position to discourage women uh, to undergo mammographic screening. Ultrasound is only a tool to help um, characterize things that we see on a mammogram or that we feel on a clinical exam. An MRI can be used selectively. Um, we don't have any population studies. They will, I doubt that there will ever be a population study using MRI as a screening tool. It's a very expensive tool. It's like 10 to 20 times more expensive than mammography. So um, clinical exam and mammographic screening. I am, um, I don't know if I'm in a minority or not of physicians, but I, I value physical exam, and I value breast self-exam. I think all breasts feel quite different, that a woman who knows how her own breast feels can only help a physician in finding an abnormality, not hurt. Um, and it's very cheap. And you, you know, you can use it as frequently as you want, but the recommendation is about once a month. Um, and, and, and I think it, um, it helps many women avoid unnecessary biopsies. Because if you're familiar with your breasts and say, you know, that lumpiness has always been there for the last 20 years, it's not something new, then um, it, it helps a physician make a correct decision. So, so I'll summarize a little bit the comment, um, which centered basically that in a personal case of uh, having had an abnormality, um, the mammogram seemed to sh show something that wasn't so distinct, although it was an abnormality. So the question is, um, will we have something better than mammography? Um, and I, in, there's a recognition in, in the world of imaging um, that we would like to have uh, better imaging. Um, the, maybe it's going to be a combination of MRI and PET, but those, those tools are quite sophisticated, and so they don't translate easily to screening uh, large populations. And so we, can't, we have to find tools that are, are just as good for the affluent populations of Palo Alto as well as um, elsewhere. Um, optical imaging has been talked about. The question is that we don't have a specific marker that's present in every cancer that, that we know that we have, let's say, an antibody that would turn a certain color to, to, to detect the, the cancer. Um, because the cancers are not all the same. So um, people are looking at using a variety of probes. There's a, there's a lot of research going on in the world of imaging and optical imaging. But I don't have the answer of what it's going to be yet. 
So, so, to, so lymph nodes, for women who have uh, no evidence clinically that they have cancer in their lymph nodes, um, those are the ones that are considered to be candidates for the sentinel node mapping procedure, in which the surgeon um, tries to identify anatomically the lymph nodes that are significant. And then the pathologist test looks to see if there are tumor cells in them. So that's considered this, the standard today for women who are thought to have no involvement of their lymph nodes in the axilla. For those that have clearly involved lymph nodes, the standard approach continues to be to do an axillary dissection and remove those lymph nodes, and sometimes even followed by radiation to um, the, the lymph node bearing areas. That's pretty standard. The clinical study that I highlighted was a study where women with very small volume involvement of lymph nodes um, in a very specific study where they also got radiation to the whole breast. And we know that when radiation therapists radiate the breast after lumpectomy, if you ever see a woman who's been radiated, that they get two-thirds up the axilla. They radiate a good part of the axilla. So some of the thinking and some of the, um, their other studies, especially in Europe, exploring, comparing whether removing lymph nodes is equivalent to radiating the axilla. I feel that surgery is, um, causes less side effects than radiation, but um, I'm sure there, my colleagues in radiation oncology disagree with me. So, uh, so after, after surgery, so the question is, can we tell if there's anything left behind after surgery? No, 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 no. If you have, okay, if you've had lymph node involvement before chemo, mm -hmm. and then you've had the chemo treatment, oh, is okay. there any way of telling how involved those lymph nodes are uh, before surgery? No. Before surgery, we can only uh, guess uh, at there being lymph node involvement after the question was, after chemotherapy, how do you know um, if there's still tumor in the lymph nodes? Um, and I guess indirectly you're asking, can, can one avoid to remove lymph nodes if you've done, if you've responded very well to chemotherapy? Um, and, you know, there is, there are ongoing studies to show that you could uh, do sentinel node biopsy uh, in patients who receive chemotherapy up front. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, so we have to, there's preliminary data that you can do that. Um, not all the clinicians agree with that approach. Um, and I think um, the trials and the studies need to mature to show that if you have a negative sentinel nodes after you've gotten chemotherapy up front, even if your nodes were involved with tumor, that we know were involved with tumor because a needle biopsy was done, um, that it's safe to stick with the plan of a sentinel node biopsy after chemotherapy. We have to wait for that data to mature. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.